Good morning. I'd like to welcome all y'all here this morning for our first mid-year cotton commission meeting. And uh, looks like we got a good crowd. A lot of people going to participate, so that's great. Uh, I'm Bart Davis. I'm chairman of the Georgia Cotton Commission. I'm a producer from Cockwood County. At this time, I'm going to ask Chris Hopkins to come up here and have a prayer. Thank you, Bart. Let's pray. Good Lord, we come to you humble today, Lord, thanking you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. We thank you for safe travel and mercies for everyone represented here. Lord, we also pray for safe travel and mercies for the rest of our family members, wherever they may be headed out today. Lord, we thank you for cotton, Lord. We thank you for agriculture, the profession that we're able to be a part of, Lord. We, we thank you for all the aspects of it and placing us here on earth to do this task, Lord. We thank you for all the men and women each and every day that are an integral part of our farms that, that make it work. And we live in a country, a uh, free country, that we can do this and we can farm for a living, Lord. We thank you for everyone who's put forth effort in making this happen today. And for that, we are very grateful. And we pray for safe travel and mercy as we depart today in a very successful meeting. In your name we pray. This is my first trip. I live in Cockwood County. Uh, first trip over here to Midville to the station, and it's a really nice station. It's a beautiful place, beautiful farmland, y'all. The crop over here looks really good over here. Looks like y'all been getting some rain and, and got a good potential. And we hope we continue to get some rain. At this time, I'm going to recognize my board members. Y'all will stand. Matt Coley from Dooley County. Stephen Meeks from Wayne County. He wasn't able to be here today. We have John Ruart from Morgan County. Chris Hopkins from Toons. Chad Mathis, Baker County. And our new board member we have is Greg Sykes from Bullock County. So he's a local here. Uh, I got some more people I want to recognize. Uh, I guess they all here are in here. Uh, ben Evans. Southeast Cotton General Association President. Hank Rinchy from Staple Cotton is here today. Shane Stevens, Staple Cotton. Don Jones, CI. Monty Bain, the Cotton Board. Dave Rupenecker, Southern Cotton Growers. Where you at, Dave? Walk, come up here a minute, if you don't mind. Executive Director, or CEO, whatever, how, how you want to say it for, is it 23 or 25 years? It'll be 23 years August 1st. 23 years August 1st, he's retired December 31st, right. to correct, right. correct. Um, Dave has worked really hard for, for the Southern Cotton Growers for 23 years, and done a great job, and this guy deserves a round of applause. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, Dusty Finley, South Asian Cotton Jenner, he, he's the guy that looks over that. He's here somewhere today. Uh, Andy works with uh, Dusty, helps look after the gins and their needs and everything. And Tass Smith, National Cotton Council, I see him just walking in the door about there. He's hiding. Do we have any, uh, all the guys here that, like, we I guess we could call them volunteers, our CI guys, our Southern guys, uh, all y'all stand up, all y'all, Cotton Board, all y'all guys that we have here today that's involved in any of them organizations, or several in the state. All these guys here do a good job and help recognize the Georgia cotton industry. At this time, I would like for Lee Crumley to come to the front. He ain't hiding, is he? Careful, I like to fail one of you. <laughs> Lee is, Lee is, is uh, a real advocate for Georgia cotton industry. He, he's, he has served in a lot of roles and still served in a lot of roles. And uh, 
he's done a really good job. He's been on the Cotton Commission board for 12 years. He decided he wanted to step back and let somebody else take 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 the place. And the uh, Greg Sykes, the guy that I just called a while ago, was the one that's taking his place. And we have something here for uh, to thank him for his service for the Georgia Cotton Commission. This is, this is a super good guy. I've gotten to know him, gotten to know him over the last 12 years. He's a good friend, and he's really dedicated to the cotton industry and has really done a good job for us. And uh, you like to say a few words? Yeah, I guess so. Um, appreciate all y'all being here today. This is a big, big deal for our side of the state. And I appreciate your attendance uh, today, uh, in particular. I uh, appreciate Bart. Bart is a uh, a great chairman. He's a, a good guy and a great farmer and a good friend. And two things I'll say about Bart, I think, if I can think about it. One is, one in particular, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you the one thing about him. Is, um, I've never known him to make a decision or promote a, 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 a situation that, that in the forefront of his mind wasn't a George Cotton group. Everything he did, everything he says is about the George Cotton group. On a state level, regional level, or even a national level. So you guys, as growers, are lucky to have Bart as, as a leader. Um, Dave Rippenicker, they've already recognized Dave, I think. But Dave was shepherding me through my southern cotton grower rotation. Good guy, and I appreciate all you've done. Dave was uh, very professional in everything you said and did. And uh, Dave, we sent through a few tense meetings at times, but uh, I appreciate your friendship. Hope you and Sean can enjoy retirement. Um, one other thing I say, and, and we're fortunate as Georgia Cotton goes with the staff. Um, it's a really good staff. The staff in my 12 years turned completely over. And it's not the three people. You know, it's not a big staff. So I think that's important to understand is there are a lot, of, a lot that goes into the Georgia Cotton Commission. Taylor and Carolina Kelly just do a good job for us and represent the industry very well, represent the Georgia Cotton Grower. Taylor's uh, innovative with some things and brings new ideas to the table. And, we're in a good position with our staff at George Cotton Commission. And I've enjoyed it. I've learned, I've learned a lot of things about the industry. It's a complicated industry. I don't mean to take so long. Go, go ahead. It's a complicated industry. When you start exporting 85% of your product, it brings in all kinds of challenges. And so it takes a lot of people to, to make all that work. And I, I appreciate uh, the complexity of the industry and, uh, and the people in the industry. So, Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you. Um, Taylor already has, but I'd like to thank all the sponsors myself. We appreciate y'all. We couldn't have our meetings and do the things we do without y'all. I'd like to say one more thing. <clears throat> uh, our extension and our cotton team, we have some really good guys that work really hard every day. Their goal is to help us cotton farmers do the best we can. We would not be where we at today without extension in our cotton team. I grow peanuts too, same way with peanuts. So when you see these guys, thank them, and if you talk to any of your representatives, your governor, always bring up support and keeping funding our extension because it has been cut a little bit in the last few years. Actually, I went and met with him one day about it and had a little conversation and had to, sometimes you have to remind people what, you know, ag is our number one Economy driver in the state, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm like, y'all cutting us, y'all can't be doing this. But anyway, I always keep that in mind. I always thank them, support them. We fund what seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year out of that dollar you give goes to extension and various things for research. That you know, I know a lot of y'all was here yesterday. Go to these stations, Tipton, Plains, Griffin, here at Midville, and see what they're doing and what we funding. And I can't thank, I ain't gonna call all of them names, but Philip and Camp and Sadeev, all y'all, I mean, y'all guys do a really good job and work with us really good, and I really appreciate it. Good, are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm ready. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bart. Uh, yeah, we, we just want to give everybody a little update about our programming at the commission. Um, and I really appreciate all the sponsors. And this, this sort of came as an idea uh, in earnest about uh, a year and a half ago. 
to come over here and do this. There was a couple things that came together, really came together that allowed us to do it. Um, but Philip Roberts and I were talking on the phone one day, and it, it was like, we could do this, and then we could do this, and then we could do this. And I said, how are we going to pay for it? <laughs> and uh, the support of our sponsors is what really allowed us to do that. And so we, we appreciate uh, all of them. Uh, i got to swap my presentation out, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, as, we, as we do all our presentations, we're going to start out with a brief breakdown of how we spend that dollar a bale. As y'all can see, the biggest part of it, like Bart says, goes back into research and extension programming with the university. We'll touch on that next. Um, and then we're doing some unique things with promotion education, and we'll talk a little bit about what the National Cotton Council and Southern Cotton Growers have going on on your behalf as well. Um, research, you know, for this 2023 crop, we're spending just shy of $800,000. Uh, and for next year, it's just shy of 750. Um, here's a list of those projects. As you can see, it's a lot of the same names. A lot of it is very applied. Uh, and a lot of it, frankly, goes to support grad students, technical support, and things like that that, that our extension and research personnel don't have funds to do on their own. Uh, but all of these people are working really hard for you. We have people uh, for this year in Tifton, Griffin, and Athens at each campus who are working on your behalf. And next year, we've got some even more unique things coming down the path. Now, Mark mentioned this a little bit, but our, you know, our, our cotton organizations are continuing to evolve uh, and move forward. Uh, as Bart mentioned, Dave is retiring uh, December 31st. Jim Davis, who wasn't apparently able to be with us today, um, is set to come on October 1st to work, work with Dave for the last quarter of the year. Monty Bain, that was mentioned. Now, Monty, we're going to recognize you. we still got a couple meetings with you. So, just wait. But he's going to retire March 31st. They're actively seeking someone to fill his role, and then Barry Worsham, who's been the CEO of Cotton Incorporated for a long, long time, um, has announced his retirement, and they have hired William Kimball uh, and identified him and, and started the transition process with him uh, to, to take over Cotton Incorporated. And William uh, ran the global supply chain program in Southeast Asia for Cotton Incorporated, so he brings a unique skill set with him um, as we move forward. Now, uh, one of our speakers later is going to touch on some farm bill things, uh, but this is, these are the main priorities for the National Cotton Council for this farm bill. To try to find a way to increase the reference price for seed cotton, to, to remove the prohibition and allow producers to take PLC and stats, uh, to strengthen support of the U.S. textile industry through the uh, EAATM program, uh, enhance the, the marketing loan program, and then, uh, not that it's relevant for anybody here, but to add a marketing loan program for uh, ELS producers. Um, now, if we can get all that done, that'll be, it doesn't sound like much, but it'll be a pretty monumental lift. Uh, and like I said, we'll touch on that in a little bit, too. Also, at lunch, Taz Smith from the Cotton Council is going to talk about the Climate Smart Cotton Program um, and how important it is. I know we've gotten a lot of questions, especially from extension agents, about that program, how to get producers signed up. Um, uh, and so they're going to touch on that. The main thing I want to tell you about that program is that you have to be a member of the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol to, to receive those funds. You have to be. Uh, there are a lot of these sustainability programs out here. Uh, all of them are government funded in some way, shape, or form. And um, there are several of them out there. We obviously are knowledgeable about the cotton one. Uh, but I would encourage you to read the fine print. Some of them may be better for your operation than others. And on that, that new deadline for uh, the Cotton Trust Protocol, the deadline has shifted to a better align with marketing dates to September 1st. You can, when you enroll, you're now enrolled for three years. Um, and then, but the main thing I want to tell you is for us to be able to continue to define the definition of sustainability, we have to have you sign up for this program. It is of vital importance to the cotton industries, uh, you know, as the number one exporter of cotton across the world, it is vitally important for us to maintain that status that we get our American producers signed up for. Georgia has done a good job signing up, but we can all do better. So. Um, and even if you do not participate in the Climate Smart Cotton Program, we still hope you will enroll uh, your bales for this year. So uh, as I, as we're, we're obviously here to answer any questions about that, um, but we'll hope you will, uh, after Taz's presentation, that you will consider enrolling. Now, a brief touch on uh, promotion education. We continue to do a lot of the things we've been doing for a long time. We support Georgia Southern Athletics, UGA Athletics. We do school farm days. Um, but we've been really creative lately 
on finding TV marketing opportunities. Uh, one we're doing right now is with a local station, WTOC out of Savannah. We're partnering with them on a back to school special. To, and you know, we, we obviously hope parents when they're back to school shopping will buy some cotton product. Um, and then we have partnered with GPB Education in the past. Um, and we're, we're looking to continue that and, and be really uh, innovative with how we do that. Now, one new thing we're doing as it relates to promotion is we're now contributors to Cotton Council International, uh, which is the, the cotton industry's export promotion arm for the United States. Um, we met with a group of Pakistani mill buyers that came through this part of Georgia last year, and it was really innovative to hear what they had to say about what they could think about the American cotton crop um, and the work that CCI does with those people. Uh, Lee Cromley, that was uh, honored earlier, is on the executive committee for CCI, um, and they do a lot. So we, we felt it was really important that we become partners in that program. Um, and yeah, one of the things that they've done recently is through one of their trade summits is um, they have real, worked really hard to get the uh, fumigation requirement for American cotton going into Bangladesh removed, which doesn't sound like a big deal. They're, they're a big user of cotton. They were convinced that every bale of cotton that came across had been infected by the boll weevil, and it was CCI that showed them that that was not the case, and we were able to get that requirement lifted. Um, speaking of the markets, there are several things uh, to watch, namely the, the war in Ukraine and currency, uh, currency markets and currency availability, but you hear a lot about demand. And I know that we can't do much about demand ourselves, but I encourage everybody to look in your own closets, look in your family's closets, <laughs> and throw away all the polyester junk in there. <laughs> and I see some of y'all out there got on some polyester. <laughs> and I don't know if we should find you or kick you out. <laughs> We're going to look at reprehensive measures for, for the future on that. Uh, I do want to plug the Cotton Board's Cotton and Coffee program. Um, it's a great program that they do. Uh, you can either scan this QR code here or uh, see Monty, Monty Bain in the back. They do monthly uh, calls to kind of deep dive on a certain issue affecting the cotton, cotton industry. Uh, the July one's obviously already passed, but here are the rest of the topics they're going to discuss. Those calls are at 8.30 on what, Monty? The, uh, the third, third, Tuesday. third Tuesday at 8.30. And they last 45 minutes or so, and they do a really good job of working with someone at Cotton Incorporated or the Council or the Cotton Board to uh, uh, kind of address whatever issue they're talking about that day. Now, we don't talk much about this, um, but you know, the cotton industry is kind of a family. Uh, we, we've got some additions uh, in, our, in our crowd this year. Uh, Camp Hand and his wife, uh, Serena and her husband, uh, my wife and I, and Caroline uh, Gentry that works for us, she's actually out on maternity leave. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we added four new members to the family this year. and. Uh, I do want to say that I know this community has had several uh, hard uh, tragedies in the last year. And uh, I just want to thank this community in particular for binding together to help those families out. It's really hard. And uh, that's what this is all about. Sometimes you just need to turn off the news and, and get with your neighbors and realize what's important. So um, with that, that's all I have for you. I will go ahead and plug our meeting for January. For those of you who go to Tifton, uh, January 31st, this is my contact information on the screen. And uh, if you need anything from me, pull me aside. Uh, but if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and bring Dr. Hand up. All right, everybody. Uh, glad to be here in Statesboro today. I've um, been looking forward to the past couple days for a long time. We were in Midville yesterday with the commission members and um, showing off the station and overall um, to me, it looks like the crop over here looks really good. You know, I made this talk close to the end of last week. And Dr. Roberts, I don't know if I was in a bad way or something last week, but I was feeling a little doom and gloom on the crop, I guess, when I made this talk. So it might seem a little negative, but it's got something I want to point out at the very end. And, you know, whenever I give a crop update uh, this time of year, I do want everybody to keep in mind that generally whenever I wind up on a grower's place, it's something like this, okay? It doesn't look great. There's something that has gone wrong, okay? If y'all have seen me on your place, it's likely because you have had a problem, okay? So a lot of you guys don't want to see me, all right? 
But, you know, just keep that in mind. A lot of times whenever I get out and see stuff in grower fields, it might not be the best thing in the world. But kind of looking back over this past season, you know, from planting up to now, um, it kind of reminds me of a roller coaster ride, okay? And so kind of thinking about this, I'm not a big thrill seeker. I didn't ride roller coasters in, in whenever I was a kid, okay? I don't like roller coasters. I don't like the uncertainty of it and all that good stuff. So this season hadn't been the most fun in the world for me, but... Um, you know, there's been a lot of up and downs this year, I'd say. They, and I think a lot of the growers in here would agree with that. A lot of our agents uh, would agree with that as well. Um, you know, some of the things that kind of come to mind in April and early May, I mean, it, it was awful cool out there, wasn't it? I mean, we, we kind of were delayed in planting in some spots, and then it started raining. And, I mean, we got frequent rains, which is really good. You know, it helped us out. And, and in some spots, I've heard growers say, that this might be the best start that we've ever had. I mean, some of the best stands that many growers have ever seen, okay? And it's because we were catching rains probably once a week, once every 10 days, something like that. The temperatures weren't too hot whenever we were planting. And so I think we got off to a really good start. Now that quickly changed once we got into about the month of June, okay? There's a few things that happened and I'm gonna talk about um, of course, the deer, uh, if anybody in here has that problem, I hear you, and we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, plant bugs, and then also severe weather in different parts of the state, and then there towards the end of June, it started raining every day, right? It rained too much. It got too wet. We couldn't get in the field and do anything, okay? And so that's kind of, you know, that first hump there and then get down in the valley, but I think you know, after being out in the last three, four days and talking with growers and producers uh, the last couple days that we, we might have turned a corner from this June spell here, okay? Our cotton is starting to take up the fertilizer, it's starting to grow off like we think it should. Um, and so I think, and we're still catching rains every, you know, 10 days or so. So, I mean, I think that so far um, we're kind of turning that corner and we're in good shape and we have good potential overall but there are some things to consider kind of moving forward and long-lasting impacts on uh, the crop and kind of whenever we get to the end of the line here and overall a lot of these things that happened in June are going to delay our maturity and so that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today all right talk about deer okay if you are a grower in this room and you think deer were worse this year than they ever have been on your place? Raise your hand, please. All right, that's a lot of people, okay? That is a lot of people. So we had a good discussion about the deer yesterday. Um, we even talked about it again at dinner last night. We're going to start investing heavily uh, time and money resources on what to do about the deer. I've started talking to um, wildlife biologists at UGA. I've gotten hooked up with somebody at the DNR. So we're starting those conversations, but at the end of the day, you guys know that it's a problem, all right? But we got to put a number to that problem to get anywhere with this. And so this winter, I'm going to try to start collecting some of that data so that we can get something done, okay? So just keep that in mind whenever I ask you to fill out a survey this winter. I know that you guys get surveyed to death, but... You know, that's information that we need and information that's valuable. But I, I've gotten more calls on the deer this time than I ever have, and a lot of the agents have called me about it, and there's agents that I don't hear from that called me about it. Whenever you start hearing from folks that you don't normally hear from because they're so good, that's when you know it's a real problem. And these are some pictures from uh, Guy Collins at North Carolina. He uh, did some work on it a few years ago. And really, you can tell the difference. The picture isn't great, but, um, you know, the, on the left side there is a, a row of cotton that uh, didn't have simulated deer damage on it. And then on the right is some that did. Okay, and you can tell there's less bowls on the plant. It's likely delaying maturity relative to an untreated crop. Okay, and so that's something to keep in mind if you've got fields that were bad, infested with deer, if you still had a stand at the end of the day. Okay, it's going to delay that crop a little bit potentially, but like I said, uh, we do intend to start dedicating a lot of time uh, towards investigating the impacts of deer on our crop and, um, you know, potential mitigation measures and things like that. And we're starting conversations with 
um, the right folks, in my opinion. Okay. Next thing I think that is going to affect our maturity of this crop is the plant bugs. Okay. There's a lot of people in this room that sprayed plant bugs that may have never done it before. Okay. There's a lot of people that didn't spray plant bugs in this room that probably should have. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they have been above average this year. They're normally higher west of I-75, but um, we were, me and Dr. Roberts came to Midville on June of 29th, and we were getting some data, some of his data, and uh, lo and behold, we, we triggered on threshold in Midville, and Anthony, we went to Anthony's office and said, Anthony, have you ever sprayed a plant bug in your life? And he said, no. And we said, well, you bought two today. And so he loaded, I mean, we were pulling out the station, and he was mixing up and getting ready to go. And so, I mean, it was serious, you know. It, and whenever we start hearing about plant bugs in this side of the state, it is a problem, okay? But uh, there are a lot of impacts that this is going to have on our crop, okay? And it's a lot of things that we may not be thinking about right this minute, but I have a very extreme example that I want to share with you guys that we had in Tiffin, okay? So here on the left is some cotton that exceeded threshold and when I say exceeded threshold it really exceeded threshold okay the first time we looked at it it was what eight per ten I mean something like that it was really high the the threshold is eight and a hundred okay eight and a hundred sweeps and so it was really really high we did not spray this cotton we kind of wanted to see what they were going to do okay and so it has right now in this picture 41 fruiting sites and it held 18 squares or small bowls, okay? And it, it was really, right now it's got inconsistent retention below node 12, which is that circle up there where it starts sticking fruit again, okay? Pretty much from there down, there ain't nothing on it, okay? Which is not good, okay? This cotton over here, little to no plant bug pressure, okay? 45 fruiting sites and 45 squares and bowls. Now I'm willing to bet that people in this room would rather have that one on the right than the other one on the left, right? That's the situation y'all want to be in. Now, what I think is interesting, and one thing that Dr. Roberts has talked about in the last couple of years, is the planting date effect on these plant bugs, okay? This cotton on the left here was planted April 25th, all right? That was some of our earliest planted cotton on the station. And it was the weirdest thing. There wasn't nothing around it. Clear cuts, planted pines, and then peanuts. I mean, there wasn't anything around it. I don't know where they came from. But they come in and they started eating and we couldn't get them out. Okay? And the rest of the field, you notice that this plant here doesn't have a single flower on it. The treated part of the field where we were pretty aggressive uh, was in the fourth week of bloom when I took this picture. All right? You see that plant there? It has not got any flowers. Okay? So, I mean, they got in there and they ate and it was serious, all right? And then you look at this one. This one was planted May 1st, a week later, and probably as the crow flies less than 10 miles, I'd say. I mean, it's, it's really close to each other, but, um, you know, the, the difference that a week made was huge, and we did not see the impacts of plant bugs in this particular field, okay? Now, at the end of the day, kind of like I said, this is an extreme example. Okay, very extreme. They, I don't want people to leave here and say, oh man, well I didn't spray plant bugs, I gotta go spray them now. It's, it's over, okay? The, I mean, the plant bugs are not quite as bad as they were a few weeks ago, okay? Um, this is really just to keep you guys aware, keep y'all in the loop, like hey, if you aren't scouting your crop, you know, or have a scout, you should have somebody paying attention to this kind of stuff because this is serious. I mean, that is a serious deal right there. And so not everybody's going to be in this situation. And two, this doesn't tell the whole story either. We don't know how it's going to end up, okay? I mean, at the end of the day, we may have some crazy something happen this fall and this crop may do better. I mean, we just don't know how it's going to shake out. But at the end of the day, y'all need to be aware of this because it's going to impact things at the end of the line. Okay, at the, at the end of the season. And so I normally show this at um, some of my defoliation meetings and stuff like that. This is uh, some data that Dr. Jerry Rutherford collected in 2019 looking at fruiting position by value on an average cotton plant. Okay, first thing I want to point out is that whenever you start removing fruit 
from a cotton plant, whether it's manually removed or, or from an insect, uh, if you remove all the fruit off that plant, you're going to delay maturity 10 to 14 days. Okay? Easy. Easy math there. 10 to 14 days behind immediately if you have 0% retention at first blow. That's something that uh, Dr. Roberts and them have been working on the last couple years. Um, you know, I do want to point out that in the extreme example that was pictured earlier, this plant here that didn't have any fruit on it, okay, the money bowls in the bottom are gone. Okay, this down here is where most of your money is, and that red line is really where that extreme plant, where the plant bugs ate so much, that's where it started sticking fruit again. Okay, and so that's going to impact things down the line. All right, that's going to impact a lot of things down the line because whenever you start removing fruit off the bottom of the plant, that helps regulate growth. Okay, it's not going to put as much into vegetative growth if it's held these positions down here. And so if you go home today or tomorrow or whatever and you start looking at your crop and see that you're missing some positions down here, missing a lot of positions down here, you need to start thinking about growth management down the line, okay? Because that plant is more likely going to revert to vegetative growth and shoot off, okay? I'll never forget a couple years ago, the plant bugs were kind of bad around Tifton, and I was talking to a grower in the area, and he said, man, there's one field I just can't get it to stop. I can't get this cotton to stop. I've put so much picks on it. And I said, well, that's kind of odd. That's not a real aggressive variety that he had planted. And he said, I just can't get it to stop. Well, at the end of the year, he called me one day. He said, hey, I'm picking. I want you to come look at this cotton. It's gorgeous. I said, okay. So we got up on the picker and looked at it. And the top was beautiful, but on the bottom there wasn't anything. And I told him, we got down and started counting nodes. And one thing that we can't do is get to, you know, October, November and say, oh, I had a plant bug problem in June. We can't say stuff like that. But when you look at a plant from the picker this fall and you see that there's not much fruit from about node 12, 11 and down, it makes me a little suspicious. Okay, makes me a little suspicious that something might have happened that we did not correct at the end of the day. So, um, you know, looking at that kind of stuff, thinking about the potential plant bug pressure that you have on your farm, um, you know, start thinking about how we're going to manage growth in that crop. We may need to be a little more aggressive on our PGR strategies just because uh, that crop is going to grow off extremely fast and revert to vegetative growth. And two, as you're picking your crop, you can see a lot from that picker seed that you can't see from the ground, okay? And so take notes of that kind of stuff. Pay attention um, whenever you're picking your crop as well, okay? Now, another reason that we're a little bit behind kind of looking at DD60s. DD60s are a way to monitor cotton growth with respect to temperature, okay? And we just talked about temperature a little bit. What happened early? It was cold, right? It was really cold. We had the coldest Memorial Day weekend on record, okay? And then now it's gotten hot. It's gotten real hot, okay? So we're catching up on uh, lost time here a little bit, but at the end of the day, we are still behind the last four years regardless of when you planted your crop, okay? The June 1st is as close to on track as we got, but really if you're looking, this, this is this year as of Monday, Okay, and I mean, it's behind it two out of the last three years at least, okay? And on average, we're behind two out of the last three years. Um, so looking at this, we are about 65 to 75 growing degree days behind where we normally are, okay? Now, today in Statesboro, we're forecasted to get anywhere from 23 to 25 degree days, okay? So I mean, this time of year when it's hot, we can catch up on this ground, okay? But it's not today that matters. What really matters is what's going to happen this fall, right? If we have a, a short season or, or a, a early frost or anything like that, that is going to impact kind of what we do. So this is DD60 accumulation in the month of October, right? And, I mean, this doesn't mean a whole lot. Last year was extremely short. And then the other three years were about normal for what we expect. But at the end of the day, over the last four years, averaged over the last four years, we averaged eight and a half degree days per day in Statesboro, Georgia. Okay? So if we're 65, 75, 80 degree days behind schedule, 
then that puts us 10 solid days in October behind. I'd argue that we're probably 10 to 14 days behind schedule just based on temperature, okay? And that's something that I've talked to a lot of our agents about, a lot of the growers I speak to pretty regular um, have noticed the same thing as well. So, kind of recapping the things that I think are going to impact the maturity of our crop the most. Of course, we have uh, deer and then the plant bugs and then the severe weather, whether it was extremely cold, extremely wet, whatever it is. There are a lot of things that are going to push our crop back a little bit. Okay, a lot of things that are going to push our crop back. And if you had more than one of these things going on, that's going to push it back even further. All right, if we had a plant bug problem that we didn't pay attention to, that's going to push us back another 10 days. Okay, so we start talking 10, 20, 30 days behind, we can get our backs in the corner or our back up against the wall in a hurry. Okay, and so something we need to be thinking about, um, we need to have a very serious conversation about the last bloom date in Georgia. Okay, and there's been some work done on this in the last couple years by a lot of our county agents. A, a lot of the participating county agents are here today. Um, but, you know, starting to look at uh, degree days from flower to mature bowl, open bowl is 850. Okay, it takes 850 degree days. I think you can get a bowl open at 650. But uh, the, the literature says 850 degree days from a, fly, a white flower to a mature cotton bowl, okay? And so thinking about that and kind of what we look at um, in this part of the state, Statesboro, uh, in the last four years, we've averaged about 730 degree days from September 1st to November 30th, all right? So we know that we can produce a bowl that gets to 650 and open that with ethophon or prep, right, at the end of the day, okay? But the research done in 2020 and 2021 showed that for most of the state, our last effective bloom date is anywhere from September 1st to September 15th, okay? Anywhere kind of in that range, and of course, there's a lot of things that impact that. I remember in 21, uh, it was extremely wet in September, and so that affected some of our retention and uh, you know yields and things like that with this project. But at the end of the day, we need to be thinking, all right, between September 1st and 15th, that's the end of the line for this crop. That's what you're going to harvest, what's on there and what's blooming in that range, okay? And really, once we start looking at after the second week of September, our odds of producing a harvestable bowl decrease significantly. Okay, so anything after September 15th, it was extremely low odds that we were going to pick that and it was going to wind up at the gym. Okay, so that's something to be thinking about. Again, keep in mind our crop is behind and so we need to do everything we can to protect what's there, maximize the yield that the yield potential that is currently there and keep in mind that uh, between September 1st and 15th, really, uh, if your crop is still blooming, that's going to be it. Okay. Now, like I said, I feel like I made this talk last week and I don't know if I was in a bad way or what, but it seems kind of negative, okay? But at the end of the day, I feel like the potential is there for this year to make a fantastic crop, okay? I really do. I took this picture in Tifton in some of uh, Dr. Roberts' cotton. It, it was planted April 1st and it might be some of the most beautiful cotton on the station. Okay, again, going around Midville yesterday, the potential is there. The crop looks incredible, okay? And even driving around in spots around here, it looks great. We have got to protect what's there, and really, at the end of the day, I think our biggest adversary in this crop is time, okay? Last year, we had a early frost, and I hope and pray that that does not happen this time. I hope we have a warm fall, and we can really finish this crop out get it all to the gin and get everybody paid. I know uh, it's short on, you know, inputs are high and, all, and the price isn't great, but, you know, I hope that we can finish this crop out and really we just need time to do that. Now, uh, Taylor did put in my title about the foliation considerations. Again, I uh, want to reiterate that this crop is behind, so do not get in any hurry to pull the trigger on the foliation just yet, okay? We uh, got a long way to go, but of course, um, the biggest thing to me is uh, defoliation timing. Timing is everything, okay? So as we get closer to defoliation, get out there and check the crop, okay? There's three ways you can make sure that your crop is ready, counting percent open bowls, 
uh, looking at note above crack bowl, and this is a good example over here where you count from your uppermost first position crack bowl to your uppermost first position harvestable bowl that you expect is going to wind up in the picker. Okay, so this crop over here is 60% open for note above crack bowl. That's a good one to pull the trigger on. Okay, and then of course the sharp knife method where you cut through, look at the seed coats, and uh, if the lint strings out, it's ready to pull the trigger. Okay, and of course as we get closer to that, I'll be putting out more stuff in our newsletter. Our agents will be communicating with you. I uh, send an email to them just about once a week uh, during the foliation time, trying to get, give everybody my thoughts and uh, kind of what we're going to think about. So stay in touch with your local uh, county agent. Stay in touch with your consultant, your scout. Um, I get a lot of calls from them as well during uh, this time of year. Okay, but at the end of the day, don't get in any hurry to pull the trigger on defoliation because we are um, a little bit behind. All right. I want to thank you guys for having me. Of course, I've been looking forward to this meeting a long time. I want to thank the commission for doing this and having us over here. Um, of course, I want to thank them, Cotton Incorporated, our extension agents. There's a lot of them here. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without them. And then our grower cooperators and industry partners as well. Um, I got a couple minutes for questions. If y'all want to talk about anything, or if not, we can uh, kind of keep going. A any quick questions? You, yes, sir. You got any solutions for hard lock cotton? No, sir. I do not. Uh, that's an environmental thing, right? It starts raining. It starts. Uh, it gets real humid there at the end of August, early September. We've looked at. Uh, last year, we invested a lot of time and a lot of energy into looking at hard lock and bull rot and different things like that, and uh, it just, it varies. You'll have one plant that's got seven bowls on it that you can't harvest, and then right next to it is perfect, you know, and it's, a, it's heavily dictated by the environment, and uh, that's just, you know, one of, the, one of the demons we have to deal with, unfortunately. Any other questions? Did you see any benefits to the prior with the, with the uh, increased plant load pressure? You going you gonna to talk about that? Or are you? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, there we had, Dr. Roberts had two studies right next to each other. One was Thrive On, one was not. And they triggered on threshold twice in the Thrive On and four times in the non. So, yes, there was a plant bug benefit for sure. The adults are still going to get in there and eat. So it's really going to help later down the road when there's immatures and stuff like that. Anything else? Let me just add a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. Pride. <laughs> <laughs> Pride is incredible in terms of protecting the plant from trips. You guys have planted it, you've seen it. it, it it's very, very impressive. But the plant load, that's one of the priorities or our program, or at least the entomology program this year. It has benefit for plant bugs. But you may still have to spray plant bugs. Okay? And, and that's something important to understand. It's going to be important you still have a scout, even with rival. And I know there's some of you in this room who don't have scouts. Rival are probably pretty good manager of risk would rather you have a scout but uh, we're still sorting through it but i can tell you with confidence it's not plant load free it still has to be managed and i guess the main thing we got to get to next is genetic potential and varieties that contain that technology right now the advantage doesn't overcome you know they're close in terms of yield but they're not a race course yet but they will be. And uh, in time, we'll learn more. But it does appear this plant data is really important. And if you're going to try some drive on, position it where you get the most value. You already know your earliest plant of cotton is where you have the highest strength structure, right? Mm -hmm. And it appears there's a very strong plant data back on plant bugs. So that first. <laughs> 25% of cotton plant, that's where I would position it for value. We'll be around for the rest of the day. If y'all have any other questions, just pull us inside and we can talk about whatever y'all want to talk about.